Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. <laughs> Tracy, this is one of those episodes that occurred to me via what I will forever call the Ralph McQuarrie method going forward. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Meaning that I had started and sputtered out on several other topics. This is not uncommon, where I'll start four different episodes in a given week and then be like, no. Uh, And after wrestling with it and trying to figure out what was wrong with me and what I actually wanted to do for a while, I just went to bed. And then I literally woke up in the middle of the night, no joke, thinking, vacuum cleaners! And then I fell back asleep. And then I was still thinking it when I woke up to my alarm clock several hours later. Uh, and I was like, well, i got to look up vacuum cleaner history and see if that's interesting. And it turned out that it is, to me, very fascinating. Hooray! Um, tracking human history, how we clean, and why our cleaning needs have shifted kind of tells the story of human progress in a wider sense. Uh, so this becomes t- a, re- a really interesting way to look at human history. Plus, we get to see the appearance of one of those topics that just pops up repeatedly on the show over and over, and that is Paxton's Crystal Palace. Uh, and also my personal and sincere hope is that I will maybe finally be able to spell the word vacuum after this without looking it up every time. Yeah, we we just in this recording session recorded the podcast on the Dreyfus Affair, and I was having the same experience with the word Alsace. Yeah, there are just some words that everyone struggles with the spelling on, and vacuum has always been mine. So before there were vacuums, getting floors and draperies and things clean was, of course, a lot more difficult and also a lot less effective But people have been trying to keep their living areas tidy for millennia, and all of this effort is for good reason. Aside for just looking neater, you've probably heard that household dust is composed of a lot of gunk. An estimated 80% of it is sloughed off human cells. Not all that pleasant to think about. About 20% that's left can have all kinds of stuff in it that's not exactly great for your general health and well-being, like pollen and bacteria, and animal dander, and lint, insect particles. I'm going to say dust mites. That can be in there. You get the idea. Yeah. I also wonder if you have a house like ours where there are many cats, uh, yeah. how those proportions change. <laughs> <laughs> We have evidence of rudimentary brooms going all the way back to 2300 BCE in Egypt and India. So a long time ago, people figured out that they didn't want all of this dust and gunk around, even if they didn't know how it was composed. Uh, The ancient Romans were known to use brooms as well. And sometimes uh, an early sort of mop that kind of had a sponge on the end of a stick instead of the plant material that was usually used for brooms. Uh, Brooms would continue to be used, of course, throughout human history, although it It is not until the 18th century that brooms used in the U.S. got a pretty significant upgrade. Before that, brooms were made by tying materials like hay or corn husks to a larger stick that served as a handle. This was functional, was not really amazing uh, in terms of the cleaning ability. The hay or straw or whatever that was used to make the bristles, that would eventually fall out and need to be retied. The story goes that in 1797, a Hadley, Massachusetts farmer named Levi Dickinson got the idea to upgrade the household brooms by using tassel-like sorghum, which is a cereal crop that he had growing on his farm, to make the brooms. And this offered such enhanced performance that other households started asking him to make them for him as well. And those became so popular that this grew into a business. So soon, Dickinson was growing more sorghum to meet demand. By 1810, a machine called a foot treadle broom machine had been developed to make better brooms that lasted longer than hand-tied ones. And by the 1830s, Levi's company, the C.D. Dickinson & Son Company, was supplying other manufacturers with the equipment to make brooms. He had really, like, had a whole career trajectory over this. And so clearly the cleaning industry had taken off. Yeah, I really feel like I was in a museum somewhere in New England that had one of these foot treadle machines. Probably. I remember the docent talking to me about it and then trying to figure out which museum that was. Um, I, I could not. I ran into just roadblocks. 
throughout the 19th century. Not only did broom manufacture increase, but thanks to the Industrial Revolution, textiles for the home became more available and more financially accessible to a wider range of households. And that meant there were more surfaces to clean. They were surfaces that could easily absorb all of that dust, uh, and then would that would get recirculated into the air through the motion of sweeping. You've probably seen photos or movies. Maybe you've done this yourself. People beating the rugs or the draperies with paddles as they hang them outdoors. And that was really the only way to loosen up the dirt and the dust from the fibers. Unfortunately, doing that also caused wear and tear on whatever was being beaten. So you got a uh, cleanliness at the expense of damage. To be clear, these kinds of textiles and their cleaning needs have been around for a lot longer than this, but before the Industrial Revolution, they tended to be owned by the sort of people who also had a staff to take care of the cleaning. Yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> the luxurious uh, and sumptuous textiles that were found in fancy homes up to that point, those owners didn't really understand the level of elbow grease that went into keeping them clean and beautiful. Uh, In 1699, the first British patent for a mechanical sweeper was issued to Edmund Hemming of London. This was not a home sweeper, to be clear. It was a street sweeper. But its design was similar to the carpet sweepers that would follow. It had a circular brush that was basically a cylinder with broom bristles on it, and that rotated as the wheels of the horse-drawn cart rolled forward, displacing the swept debris behind and to the sides of the mechanism. That's basically how a lot of floor sweepers work. But it wasn't until 1811 that a home-use product with a similar design was first patented in Britain. That was James Hume's sweeping machine, which required the user to place the rolling box in position and then turn a hand crank to rotate the wheels, and then they would move it to the next position. This just sounds very fiddly to me. It sounds arduous. Like, you put it down, you crank the wheel to get the brush to do the thing, you pick it up, you do the same thing over... I would give up and just be like, well, I live with a dirty floor. That's what's up. Um, In 1853, another English inventor named James Haddon Young patented his hand-sweeping apparatus. This integrated the handle, the brush roller, and the dustpan into one simple machine, and it had a fabric cover. This one is interesting because it lists carpets, floors, and pavements as the surfaces it could sweep in the patent, and that makes it the first home-use sweeper that mentioned a carpet. Young invented a sweeper that had a lot of features you would find on a carpet sweeper today, and he really solidified the design with his follow-up a year later. In that second iteration, the dustpan was hinged for easy access, and the fabric cover was emitted in favor of a box cover made of wood. So it probably is starting to sound like something you have seen or used before. Lucius Bigelow got a British patent for his carpet sweeper several years later on June 11, 1858, This one is almost identical to a modern model. Had large wheels at the sides that also drove the rolling brush. The first time I ever saw one of these was in the library at my high school or my middle school, I think. And it was really good for, like, getting the little paper bits from our three, from our, like, spiral notebooks up off Uh of the library floor. Like, that was really the scope of its ability to lift things. Its primary function. Also in 1858, Boston resident Hiram Herrick got a patent for a carpet sweeper. And this one looked an awful lot like the British patent for the same device. It is basically identical to Bigelow's sweeper, and it was almost certainly copied since British copyright law did not apply in the U.S., There were several similar patent applications filed in late 1858 that also almost certainly copied Bigelow's design. One of those, designed by Reuben Shaler of Connecticut, had actually refined the box that contained all of the components into a lower-profile form. More than 250 patents for variations on carpet sweepers were issued in the U.S. in the last four decades of the 19th century, although only about one-fifth of them were ever actually made, and most of those pretty quickly fell by the wayside. They didn't stay in production. Even Herrick, who had managed to get his into production and seemed to be doing pretty well for himself, found a lot of his high-volume orders were canceled as this U.S. Civil War began. 
1860, a man named Daniel Hess in West Union, Iowa, was granted a patent for a carpet sweeper that introduced the use of air. Quote, the nature of my invention consists in drawing fine dust and dirt through the machine by means of a draft of air, forcing the same into water or its equivalent for the purpose of destroying it substantially. This machine needed a bellows to operate. He probably never actually built one. Yeah, he may have built a prototype. He certainly never went into production on it. On June 8, 1869, Ives W. McGaffey of Chicago got a patent for his sweeper design that used a fan in an upright machine called the Whirlwind. It required hand cranking to operate that fan. McGaffey was clear in his goal in his patent. Quote, The accumulation of dust and dirt in dwelling houses is a source of great annoyance to all good housekeepers. To obviate these difficulties is the object of my invention. The whirlwind was expensive, $25. This is at the end of the 19th century. Uh, And while it was teetering on the brink of creating the kind of suction that could effectively lift the dirt out of carpets, the fact that it was hand-cranked meant that it was a lot of work to get the fan going fast enough to pull the dust and the dirt into the receptacle bag. So this whirlwind did not really take off. He's so close, though. Yeah. He's so close. <laughs> the idea of trying to hand crank a thing or use a bellows while also trying to sweep the sweeper, like, that just seems like way too much effort. Yeah. You have to be, um, like, I, I envision something like those one-man band contraptions where somebody is just super dexterous and can do many things at once. In 1876, two carpet sweepers were brought to the U.S. market that proved very, very popular. The first was manufactured by the Gore and Edgecombe Company of Indiana, and that sweeper, which was called the Lady's Friend, became a very big seller. It was a very simple sweeper, but it had a rubber friction drive that helped the brushes pick up a lot more dirt and dust from carpets. Yeah, um, as I was looking for a picture to accompany this episode, it became clear that the idea that sweepers and vacuums and things might make a good gift for a woman (laughs) <laughs> that goes back to the very beginning of their existence, unsurprisingly. Uh, we are about to talk about another sweeper, and one that has a name that you'll probably recognize. But before we get to that and how it was innovative, we will take a quick sponsor break. The other popular sweeper of 1876 came from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and it was patented by Melville R. Bissell. Bissell and his wife Anna were in the crockery business when they started tweaking the design of a sweeper that they used in the shop to make it more effective at managing the dust. And soon, they were manufacturing their own sweepers. The Bissell sweeper moved the reduction gears that moved the brush to the center of the brush, so it was away from the ends where the cogs were on other sweepers. And that meant this Bissell sweeper could get right up to the baseboards and sweep up as much debris as possible. They upgraded that center-positioned gear drive to a belt friction drive, and they named that the Bissell Center Bearing Sweeper. And the Bissells had hustle. Like, they sold their sweeper from their wagon. They would take it out in the streets, and they would be on either side of it, kind of talking to potential customers. And they would demonstrate its effectiveness by using dirt that they picked up from the road to toss onto a rug that they traveled with in the wagon. And then they would show how effective their design was at managing that dirt. And this worked. People were convinced. So the Bissells quickly built up not only direct-to-consumer sales, but also shipping contracts with retailers. And they had to pretty rapidly expand their manufacturing facilities just to keep up with demand. They also started building luxury models made with beautiful wood finishes and marketing them as holiday gifts, like Tracy referenced right before the break. Uh, It was like, this is a beautiful gift to give your wife. (laughs) No, thank you. Uh, 13 years into the life of the Bissell Carpet Sweeper Company, Melville died of pneumonia. And at that point, Anna became one of the first women executives in the U.S. because she took control of the company. She grew the company substantially, and she rolled out one of the first employee health benefit packages in the country. And even Queen Victoria approved of Bissell Sweepers being used in her residence 
That's a pretty big endorsement, and it was a huge boon to expanding their international sales. In 1898, a gasoline-powered carpet sweeper device was invented by John S. Thurman of St. Louis, Missouri. His patent for it includes the inventor's own endorsement of its efficacy. Quote, I have found by observation of a machine with which I have conducted experiments that the renovator relieves and collects nearly all, if not all, the dust and dirt from the carpet over which it has traveled. So this still did not have vacuum power the way we would think of it today, but it did use what Thurman referred to as an air blast to do the work. This was a shot of highly compressed air that both served as a force to beat the dust out of the surface and as a blowing mechanism to send the resulting uplifted dirt and dust into a waiting container. In his patent paperwork for the pneumatic carpet renovator, Thurman described it this way, quote, the invention may be said to consist briefly in a pneumatic dust extractor designed to be placed over or in close proximity to the carpet, whereby an air blast is projected into and through the carpet, forcing the dust out and into the collector where it's accumulated and is subsequently removed. But while Thurman's invention was pretty effective, it also was not something that the average person could purchase, and it it wasn't really intended for that. It was intended to be a service vehicle. And we say vehicle because it was the size of a carriage, and you absolutely had to have a horse to pull it. And for $4, you could have Thurman's pneumatic carpet renovator visit your home to give it a deep clean. Yeah, also on my list of no thank you is like anything with an internal combustion engine to be used in my house powered by gasoline. Well, it stayed it would be outside. On the outside. But the And then the hoses ran in. Yes. Um, but the description of it is as gas powered at first made me be like, no. It nope. sounds terrifying. It yes. does. <laughs> so this is where we get to Hubert Cecil Booth. Booth saw all the efforts to improve on Thurman's pneumatic cleaner, but also felt like they were missing something, and he believed correctly that suction was the key element that every effort was missing. Bellows had been used on some versions of sweepers over the years. We talked about a couple earlier, and that that sort of pulled in the dirt a little bit, but that was not a very effective method. So... A brief and very oversimplified explainer on suction. Uh, It is all about air pressure. So usually this is explained when most people are saying, here's how this works. Uh, It's in terms of drinking through a straw, right? When you suck on a straw, you're creating a pressure differential between the top of the straw and the bottom, and your beverage travels from the area of higher pressure at the bottom to the area of lower pressure at the top. In a vacuum cleaner, it's the same basic idea. Uh, Air in a chamber is blown out of the chamber by a fan upward, creating a drop in pressure that creates suction at the air inlet. So if a machine has such a chamber and a fan blowing air out quickly as you run that inlet hole over a surface with particles on it, those particles are sucked up into the chamber. And a filter keeps those particles from flying out the exhaust hole. And we should note, that there is not actually a vacuum in a vacuum cleaner if you want to be really scientifically um, specific about it. This isn't an absence of air, which would define a vacuum, but Booth claimed to have coined the term vacuum cleaner when he was working on his problem. Other people have said he, he was not the one, but regardless of whether it was him or someone else who first called it a vacuum cleaner, that is the name that stuck. According to Booth, he once had a conversation with an inventor of a motor-driven cleaning rig at an expo at London's Empire Music Hall. And he said, quote, the machine consisted of a box about a foot square, having a bag on top to which compressed air at 90 pounds pressure was supplied. The air was blown down in the carpet from two opposite directions as inventor trusted to the reflection from the surface underneath the carpet to drive the dust and air into the box. Booth didn't see how this would really clean properly since he suspected that a lot of the dust would get blown out to the sides as those two streams of compressed air met. And he asked the inventor if the man had tried to find a way to suck out dust rather than beat it out of the fabric with air blasts. And apparently this query was met with some bristle, although we only have Booth's side of the story, but according to his account, quote, he became heated, remarking that sucking out dust was impossible as it had been tried over and over without success. He then walked away. 
That quote and the one describing the mechanism are from an article that Booth wrote in the 1930s, and he doesn't name John Thurman specifically in that writing, but based on records, it appears that that was who he was speaking with and who he consequently irritated. Booth had a background in engineering, and it was a pretty impressive one. At the time, he was working for the firm Maudsley, Sons, and Field, which designed things like Ferris wheels and suspension bridges all over Europe. So Booth put his engineering know-how to work, and he set out to tackle this suction problem himself. Okay, uh, this is gross. So just know if you are really icked out, which pr- specifically having lived through the last year and a half, this might really, really horrify you. Just know, maybe hop ahead a little bit. Uh, In that same article from 1936, Booth described a really unhygienic thing that he did to test whether suction worked and how much suction was really going to achieve cleanliness in the way that he thought it could. So he wrote, quote, I thought over the matter for a few days and tried to experiment by sucking with my mouth against the back of a plush seat in a restaurant in Victoria Street with the result that I was almost choked. I came to the conclusion that I could construct a machine to work by suction. This to me is so contrary to all of his smartness in engineering. I'm like, wait, you just put your mouth on public stuff? Yeah, I'm also like, did you not have a plush surface in your own house? So at least it would be your own dirt at that point. (laughs) Anyway, the result of his efforts was a contraption he dubbed Puffing Billy, for which he received a patent in August of 1901. It was large like Thurman's machine, and it was pulled by horses, This trolley vacuum was a bright red box that looked almost like a shed on wheels, and the first iteration of Puffing Billy had a piston suction pump, but he later switched that to a turbine fan. And Puffing Billy, which had been named after a locomotive apparently, uh, quickly became a popular sight around London. It was colorful and it was large, and for Booth it was quite lucrative. Like Thurman, he charged a fee to visit customers' homes. And he had a team of operators employed by his company, Booth's British Vacuum Cleaner Company. And those operators would arrive on site, they would run hoses into the windows for the customer, and then they would start up the gasoline motor on the cart. And air was drawn through the hoses and filtered as it reached that red cart. There was also a showmanship aspect to all of this work because the dirt that accumulated was held in a glass-walled receptacle that both the client and passersby could see to know how effective the process was. So a little bit of advertising while you're doing your job. This was a huge success, but Booth was dogged by legal problems early on. Other inventors claimed that Booth had taken their idea and he was able to prove he had not. And some people also lodged formal complaints about the trolleys themselves, saying that they were a nuisance that clogged streets and scared the horses. <laughs> I mean, it seems like it could. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, it's it was not a small contraption by any means. Like I said, a shed on wheels. But Booth was able to weather those early problems, and soon his customer base actually included some very prestigious contracts. He was asked to clean Westminster Abbey in 1902 in preparation for the coronation of King Edward VII. And after that, he kind of became a favorite of the royal family. Edward and his wife, Queen Alexandra, actually purchased two puffing billies for the two major homes of the royals, Windsor Castle and Buckingham Palace. Hubert Booth was also able to file a U.S. patent, and his brother Stone Booth ran a second office of their business in Boston, Massachusetts. During World War I, multiple puffing billies were used to clean the Crystal Palace. We have talked about Paxton's Crystal Palace on the show before. It was an immense structure. And during the war, that famed structure was used as a training facility for the Royal Navy. And when there was a spotted fever outbreak, Booth and his billies were called in, and they cleaned a reported 26 tons of dust and debris from the building in a rafters-down full sweep. Even though Booth had cracked the problem of suction, this machine was enormous. There were buildings outfitted with their own setups based on Booth's design in the early 20th century to create central vacuum systems, but those buildings, whether they were homes or hotels, needed to have a spare room that they could dedicate to housing the main gasoline-powered engine. And again, this means there's a gas-powered engine inside your home, which is not great for various reasons. Obviously, it was not something the average family could really manage, even if they did have the money for such a thing. 
In an advertising poster from about 1906, the British vacuum cleaner company was obviously appealing to very wealthy clientele with an image of a woman in a maid's uniform hugging an anthropomorphized vacuum sweeper end with the caption, friends. Ultimately, though, Puffing Billy was outpaced by much smaller models. Your maids will love it. (laughs) Very clear message. Uh, As electricity became more ubiquitous in the early 20th century, electric vacuums were developed. No longer gas-powered, thank goodness. And this is a period when a lot of names that we associate with vacuum cleaners still today started manufacturing vacuum cleaners, such as Electrolux and Kirby. Eventually, of course, the vacuum cleaner became compact enough that it could be put into a form that you could push along the floor while standing upright the way most folks use them today. And we will tell you how we got to that after we hear from some sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History Class going. In 1907, the idea of a personal vacuum cleaning device took a huge step forward. That was thanks to a man who had both asthma and a job that involved heavy-duty cleaning, which is obviously not a great combination. That man was James Murray Spangler. Spangler was 60 and was working as a night janitor in a Canton, Ohio department store. He got the idea to start tinkering around with existing technologies for vacuum cleaners. He's famously said to have combined a sateen pillowcase, a broom, and an electric motor. And the way this story is often relayed, it kind of sounds like he was just a random guy who was trying to solve a personal problem, but really Spangler was an inventor. He had invented a velocipede wagon, a hay tetter, and a rake, as well as a grain harvester. And he took the cleaning job to make ends meet and put together the funds so that he could just keep inventing things. He was supporting his invention habit with this cleaning job. Yeah. And he was initially actually modifying a Bissell carpet sweeper. Uh, He only attached a motor to it initially, which made the work go faster, but he still had problems with his asthma from the dust that it kicked up. And after that, he decided he needed a receptacle for the dust. So then he built a machine from scratch using a wooden soapbox, a motor from an electric fan, and a section of broom handle that he had cut down to size and made into a circular brush by stapling goat hair onto it. And he used the aforementioned pillowcase as the dust bag and attached a broom handle to push it around. And proof of concept was established at this point, so he soon made a second version that had a metal drum instead of a wooden box, and he refined the movement of the brush. Spangler's device sucked up dirt and then it blew it into the attached pillowcase. And just in case you're wondering, sateen is a very tightly woven fabric. So it would have pretty effectively contained most of the particles while also allowing the air to slowly pass through it. This worked really well, and it was compact enough and upright so that a single person could manage it. You didn't need a whole crew of people to come with a cart outside your house. (laughs) Now I'm kind of like, I don't know, that sounds fun too. You still can do that in some ways. Uh, Spangler, buoyed by how well his project had turned out, applied for a patent in the autumn of 1907. And then once he had that patent in hand, he quit his janitor job and he opened his own company, Electric Suction Sweeper. But while Spengler was clever in inventing things, he did not have a head for business. He had investors and ordered motors and set up a production space, but he spent a lot more than his investors had committed. So he took out a loan, and then he used his house as collateral. Yeah, these are basically like any rules of business he was like doing the opposite of. This was obviously not the wisest move, and Spangler was soon in a position where he was not only going to lose his business, he was going to lose his house. But the deus ex machina in this story came in the form of his cousin, who had one of his early vacuum cleaners and loved it, and whose last name you will recognize in relation to vacuum cleaners, that cousin was Susan Hoover. William Hoover was Susan's husband, and when his story meets up with Spangler's, the Hoover company was focused on leather goods, specifically horse accessories, it was not exactly a booming business as automobiles were coming into the picture. But William Hoover, unlike his wife's relative, did actually have a head for business. So he bailed Spangler out by purchasing the patent from him, and then Hoover took a very methodical approach to developing a business model around this invention. 
He and his sons reorganized Spangler's company and assumed both its assets and its debts. And Spangler remained with the company as a salaried employee, and he also got royalties from sales. With Hoover helming a more structured rollout under this new setup, the vacuum cleaner went to market with an army of door-to-door salesmen ready to demonstrate the machine's cleaning power and ease of use. The Hoover Model O went to market in 1908 at a price of $60. Attachment accessories were an extra package. An ad was placed in the Saturday Evening Post offering free in-home demonstrations and requests for home trials quickly outpaced their production numbers. The Hoover Vacuum Division stepped up to the challenge. Engineers were hired to improve and refine the design for better function. And after having to throttle their advertising and pull it back a little bit to catch up to interest, ads came back touting the long life of the motors that they had developed and reminding consumers that, quote, dust is full of disease. From there, the home consumer market for vacuum cleaners was established, and soon manufacturers were springing up everywhere, either attempting to patent their own models or licensing the rights to manufacture other people and companies' designs. Here's perhaps the most surprising part of the vacuum cleaner's lifespan as a home-use product. It has not really changed very much in a century. Uh, They still all work in basically the same suction principle, but there have, of course, been some innovations, uh, and we'll talk about those. And one of the biggest was the introduction of a vacuum that you could pick up in one hand to deal with small messes. In 1975, Black & Decker applied for a patent for a cordless vacuum. And this was a development that was many years in the making. While Black & Decker had a reputation as an innovator in the 1940s and 50s, over time, their mass market appeal had led to a perception that they were making things that were kind of like a budget brand for the home user only. They got fewer and fewer high-end contracts. This then impacted their products for the home market, though, because the innovation from those professional contracts was driving the technology that would eventually end up in consumer products. Yeah, that's still in most fields today, like how a lot of it works. It's kind of like how people are like, why do we need haute couture? And it's like, well, those are developing designs that you'll see on on racks in your local store in a couple of years. Similarly, electronics and technology things are often developing high-end contracts for things that they will figure out how to make at a more uh, cost-effective level for a home consumer. And that's exactly what happened here, because in the early 1960s, Black & Decker gained a contract with NASA to develop cordless, no-torque tools that would be safe for astronauts to use on missions. You have probably seen photos from the Apollo 15 mission of David Scott drilling on the lunar surface, and that tool that he's using was a drill specifically designed for the mission by Black & Decker. The tool was also used on the Apollo 16 and Apollo 17 missions. Through the company's work with NASA, Black & Decker was able to do enough research and development to start designing cordless products for the consumer market. That led to the company's cordless vacuum patent, After the Dust Buster was launched in 1978 and in a home appliance market that was being flooded with competition, that handheld vacuum for dry messes just clicked with consumers. It outperformed all the projected sales numbers. We had one at my house growing up. Uh, Because it did so well, another patent was quickly filed to protect the product's design form. Now, of course, there are vacuums that are much smaller for all kinds of specialized tasks like cleaning keyboards and sewing machines. But at the time, this was pretty revolutionary. Oh, I remember literally this being, like, discussed in my school and people being like, my mom is getting a dust buster and it being this huge thing. Uh, it was it was the, um, the acid wash jeans of the cleaning world at the time. <laughs> in 1991, famously, James Dyson introduced a bagless vacuum cleaner, one that pivoted on a ball rather than having two small wheels on the back end. He had already used the ball as pivot concept on another invention, which he called the ball barrow. Yes, that is a wheelbarrow with a ball where the wheel would normally go. And it was while solving a problem with the painting of his ball barrows that he got the idea for the cyclonic separation that would be central to the design of his new vacuum cleaner. The air filter in his factory was getting clogged with powder particulate from the finishing spray that was used on the ball barrows. So he used a cyclone tower to separate out the powder particles from the air and prevent that buildup on the filters. 
cyclonic separation works like this. The air is pumped through the top of a cylinder. It's conical at the base. And as the air, which is moving really quickly, rotates through the cylinder, the particles in the air are flung out to the outer wall of the cylinder because they're heavier than the air is. As a consequence, the air down at the base of the cylinder has less particulate in it. So in a vacuum cleaner, when it passes up through a central tube to the exhaust, it can be filtered. That leaves less debris buildup on the filter than if you had just sucked up the dust and dirt through a typical vacuum cleaner. The buildup around the sides of the cylinder can then just be dumped into the trash. Yeah, this was huge at the time. Uh, When James Dyson developed his vacuum cleaner based on this idea, he actually had a really hard time getting it to market. That gets into a whole discussion of, like, why people did not want to adopt this that we're already making uh, vacuum cleaners, the prevailing discussion being around how that uh, selling of vacuum bags was its own whole moneymaker and nobody wanted to sidestep that. Uh, He had patented it in 1979, but it actually took more than a decade to get it perfected, and even then, no one in the industry was interested. Eventually, he had to introduce his G-Force model through the Japanese market. At that point, it was a whopping $1,800. But from that bumpy start, the Dyson vacuum cleaner line has continued and flourished, still without bags, to present day with a range of models available. They're still kind of expensive for a lot of folks, though. Uh, The low end is around $350, depending on where you shop, but certainly far less than that initial price tag. I'm just going to say credit card reward points is how I bought myself. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, In 2002, the Roomba debuted, and that ushered in an era of vacuums that will bounce around your home, doing the little maintenance cleaning without a lot of human involvement. The first Roomba was a 13.4-inch diameter disc that was three and a half inches high. Others almost immediately were on the market. By the end of 2003, an estimated 500,000 robotic vacuum cleaners were sold worldwide, and in the Friday episode... Uh, Holly's going to talk about how their Roomba died. Uh, In 2018, Nito Robotics created a robotic vacuum cleaner that uses LiDAR technology to scan a room and then map out the most efficient pattern for cleaning. And who knows what comes next? Something else very magical that will talk to you? We don't know. This made me shockingly eager to vacuum because now I'm like, oh, now I understand how this works. Yeah. Which is a miracle in and of itself. Yeah, I. it is really interesting to me. I had not, I mean, it's obvious in some ways, but I hadn't really thought about how much, um, you know, that availability of textiles really drove this, like, we got to figure out how to clean this better. Uh, there was one book that I read that said carpets are either the hero of the story or the villain, depending on your point of view. Sure. Because that's what made everybody suddenly be like, how do we clean these? <laughs> Yeah. I don't want to pick it up and take it outside every time. It just needs a little maintenance. Uh, And now, almost never. My first apartment was all hardwood floors and had, I think, like one small area rug next to the bed so that when I got out of the bed, my feet did not hit cold wooden floor. And I did not have a vacuum of any sort the whole time I was living there. I think I had like one tiny handheld thing that I used for that little little area rug. It was your inherited dust buster, probably. It was not. It was a, I got it for Christmas, I think. It had a cord uh, and it had a little, it had a revolving brush. So it was a little more. Gotcha. Involved than a dust buster was. And now there are rugs that you could just throw in the wash and sidestep yep. needing to vacuum clean them completely. Have one of those too. Us too. Um, which is a whole other thing that I can also talk about on the on Friday's show, because I don't like carpeting and rugs. Um, but I do like this listener mail because it's about cooking. Uh, this is from our listener, Greg, who writes, Hi, Tracy and Holly. I enjoyed listening to your recent discussion of ancient cookbooks. It reminded me of learning how to cook from my grandmother. Seems there are things that transcend the centuries when it comes to lack of detail in the instructions. Before going off to college many years ago, I sat down with my grandmother to document some old family recipes. She is from the old country, having been born in Greece. One of these recipes was for pastizzo, a Greek dish similar to lasagna, which, by the way, delicious. Uh, Among the ingredients was a quart of milk, with her instructions to take a quart of milk and pour it over the mixture, followed by the baking. Making the dish for the first time, 
It was a disaster. The taste was roughly correct, but the consistency was more like a noodle soup. My roommates were not impressed. It turns out, quart of milk was just a description of the container and was not intended to convey any sort of measure of how much to actually use. So grab the carton of milk and pour in just enough to saturate the mixture is what she actually intended. That corrected, the next attempt came out much better. Future recipes were documented by me watching her actually making the dish, stopping her as needed to measure what she actually used. Keep up the great work, Greg. Uh, Boy, do I know this story and grandmothers. (laughs) (laughs) And it's funny because I... um, I mentioned before, like, my mom was not into me being in the kitchen or any of us kids because that was, like, her domain. But, like, you know, in talking to her or my grandmother, there were never any measures discussed. It was like, oh, you want to put in some cheese there and you'll do a little bit of this. And it frustrated me to no end. I'm like, we need accuracy and numbers or I'm never going to figure this out. And now I do the same horrible thing when people (laughs) ask me how to make stuff. I'm like, I don't know. I just I I threw in a little bit. I don't know. It came out okay. Um, I'm (laughs) trying to be better about it. Um, But that's sometimes the fun as you figure it out. Also, you know, sometimes those accidents can lead you to realizations that help you develop new dishes. So Mm -hmm. it's all in good fun. Plus, uh, as I always say, Which I learned from my father-in-law when he retired. He started cooking a lot. And he said, sometimes I mess up, but I can always eat the evidence, which is a great approach to to cooking, unless it's abysmal. (laughs) If you would like to share your cooking disasters or triumphs with us, you can do that by writing us at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History. And if you would like to subscribe to the podcast and just haven't gotten to that yet, it's super easy. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app or pretty much anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.